Now, I have here a card that someone sent me, a beautiful little card. It's beautiful to me. It has on it a lovely young lady, and she's in a sort of a, a gloom, and she's bending over and looking down, and around her are a number of little lights and little figures, which could be what we would call fairies or something else, all around her. Now that's a very famous card. And there are many other famous cards. I'm not talking about modern art. I'm talking about older art. The famous cards of of things like fairies and, you know, done in a, in a real way. Why do, they, why do we buy cards like that when we all know that there's no such thing as fairies? Why do some of us still find that it is, that there's a beauty in it? Why? I mean, if you're scientific, you know it's all bullshit, don't you? You know, if you're a real, if you've got a real sharp, rational mind, you know it's all rubbish. <laughs> yeah, well, I would expect you to say that. But to me, it's not rubbish, you see. It's an aspect of the other. But let's, let's examine it. Why do we, why do we enjoy things like that? that obviously have no reality here, whatever. As a matter of fact, shows some sort of a, a demented mind. Or a, why do we have cards like that and why do we buy them? And why do children, especially children, love to play with uh, little figures of animals? Teddy bears? Dolls? Why do they love to talk to them? Why do they talk back to themselves from the dolls and the teddy bears? Why do they put them into bed? And, and why do they love them and hold them? And why so frequently do, do some children uh, talk to something in the room around them? And the very sensible parents say, now stop it, you're only imagining it, you know some very rational parent, would destroy the child's perception. For that's what adults are for, to destroy every bit of innocence that ever was born with their rational scientific minds. But not all. And yet some can foster it, encourage it in a wrong way, and therefore make it and turn it into imagination and someone who's always looking for dreamland in the midst of this very, very nuts and bolts existence. So there's a fine balance there. But the question is, why do we, so many of us, enjoy these mythic pictures, uh, such as the myths of, uh, of uh, Dawn, who's that guy in that picture over the, the nymphs, you know, in the pool? Hmm? Hmm? Hyla. Hyla. Yeah. Now, he was a, he, he's over a pool, you see. And he's looking in, and up comes the spirit of the water, the spirit of the pool, the spirit of this wonderful pool in this glade. And up they come, and the spirit happens to be the seven or eight beautiful maidens. And they're smiling at him, and he's reaching down like this into the pool to them. A most beautiful picture, a wonderful thing, because it's true, it's real. Because the water has a spirit in it. And the spirit in it, for man, is these beautiful maidens that come up. They don't really come up, but that's the other. That's the other, you see. That's the other. That's, that's this wonderful world which the children have just come out of. We left it a long time ago. And our perception of it is buried mostly under our heavy, heavy burden of our life and our partnerships and God knows what, buried under that. But when the little child is born, 
often they're still in touch with the other. And they can talk to the other because they've come out of the womb of life. Are you hearing me? For Christ's sake, are you hearing me? A child that's re just been born has come out of, we would say, the womb of the mother, but it is the womb of life. And in the womb of life, everything is there. Everything is possible, but it's all pure energetic. It's beautiful, whatever it is, it's just magnificent completeness. And so the child comes from that place and uh, it brings with it some knowledge of that. And so it wants to, it wants animals that talk, cartoons or anything. It wants uh, funny little puppets and things which, which resemble something of the, of the little ones uh, in, the, in the other, although they're not little ones at all. It's all energetic. And then the, the teenager, the woman, girl comes in. She comes in. And what does she want? Well, as you know, I say that woman is 100% love. And she comes into existence as a child. And then uh, when the uh, sexual energies start to rise in her, what does she want to do? She's a virgin. And she says, I just want to be loved. Oh, I can do my studies and I can do that and I can go to university and I can drive a car or I can do all those things. But really, what, I, really, what I'm waiting for is for a man to truly love me, to take me in his arms, to put them around me and embrace me, to tell me he loves me and for me to feel the warmth of his body and the beauty of his kisses so that I will have what I left And then the rude awakening when the sexual boy, when the awkward sexual experimental boy gets hold of her and uses her and she wonders what the hell has happened and she's scarred for life. Or the sexual man gets hold of her and she's scarred for life again because it's never never like it was, like she knew love to be. Because love, such love is so rare here. And that's why every woman, every single woman waits because she's 100% love, waits to be loved like she was loved from where she came, from whence she came. 